Do you find plants as fascinating as I do? With animals, they run around, they jump on us, they have feelings, we can easily fall in love with them. But this is how I feel about plants. Unlike animals, they can't run around and move. They have to grow where that seed has happened to fall. And yet, they've been on Earth for a lot longer than animals have. And as a matter of fact, they're the source of food for many of the species. So from a young age, say five, six, I was observing how plants grow and what needs they have. They need water, they need air, they need light and nutrients from the soil. And they don't have an easy life. They get stepped on, they're eaten by animals, insects, attacked by diseases, but they eventually they do grow, they produce flowers, seeds, and then they die. So my fascination led me to start experimenting with them and um, just to see how they react to certain stimuli. So I would take a plant that is facing outside the window and turn it 180 degrees inside the house just to watch it tilt back and watch outside the window. And it's not because they're nosy, but because they need the light. I would squeeze the sap out of some plants and feed another species of plants just to see how they react, they're growing better or not. But I wasn't always kind to them. I used to not water them or chop a few leaves off or branches and uh, sometimes put washing liquid or bleach on them. So I have to admit I have killed a few plants in my lifetime. But because plants cannot move, they have developed their chemical skills. Everything that plants do and how they react depends on chemicals that they manufacture internally. And they've also developed their physiology to respond to certain surroundings. They're very well aware that we exist, we're there, and animals, and wind, and air, and temperature, and water. They can communicate. They communicate by producing volatiles, and volatiles are chemicals that travel in the air. So they can attract uh, insects to spread their pollen, or they can repel insects if they know that they're gonna be eaten. And they can also communicate with other plants with the same volatiles, where they can warn another plant nearby of a potential attack by a disease. And yet, they do that without being able to see, to touch, to smell, to taste, or feel. And plants have developed an amazing connection with the environment and also the species on the planet. Another very important thing that plants can do is photosynthesize, and very unique. So they use air, as in carbon dioxide, they use light and water to produce energy. And this energy turns into biomass. And biomass is what is food, basically, and what sustains life on Earth. So I followed my passion and found out how complex the plants are, how crucial they are for life. And I educated myself to the point of a postdoc and became a crop scientist and soil scientist until they said there's no much you can do at universities, uh, you have to get a job. So following that career path, I would have ended up as a lecturer, uh, and I did this for a little bit, but I was more interested into applied research, and applied research is research that can translate into something that can be enjoyed by plants globally. So after having a few years uh, of experience in the industry, I set up my own company, ventured out, had too many ideas. So the first technology that I developed it was called R100. And R100 is a biostimulant that stimulates plants to produce more chlorophyll. It was a simple idea. If we produce more chlorophyll, which allows photosynthesis to happen, then we produce more biomass. And producing more biomass 
biomass means more yield. So we developed this with phytochemicals. We put a patent, and that was sold to a multinational. So I'm proud to say that this technology is now enjoyed by billions of plants over millions of acres across Europe. Simple idea, uh, simple to develop once you've done it, but it did take three years to do so. Another technology that we have and is uh, patented and, and sold in the market is called TECAL. And TECAL stands for Technology Calcium. Calcium is important for plants because it goes into the cell wall and it improves the rigidity. So having a strong plant will fight better diseases and any bacterial attacks. The way we did this was, again, with phytochemistry, where we developed the synergy that stimulates the plant to release calcium that is trapped or stored into an organelle in the plant cell called the vacuole. So once that calcium is released into the cytosol, and cytosol is the internal space of the plant cell, it counterbalances the acidity that is built, and that acidity is basically plant stress. So by reducing the stress of the plants, we can make plants grow faster and better. And what remains is absorbed by the cell wall. And this is what makes the fruit, vegetables, leafy salads, berries, to have an increased shelf life, which means they last longer in the supermarket or when we get them. And that has a significant reduction in the amount of waste food the fresh produce industry uh, produces. But I'm not the only person that I'm fascinated by plants. Uh, many before me and uh, many after me sure will. They have selected plants for their nutrition, for how much yield they produce, and uh, how they grow in different environments and how they thrive. And although agriculture, which is the domestication of, of plants, uh, it has fed and is feeding a growing population, it is also causing a great pollution. It's affecting the environment negatively. And if we don't do something about it, we're going to further deplete soils, we're going to reduce our water reserves, we're going to increase the weather events that we see, the extreme weather events, cause more air pollution, and get to the point where we can't grow plants anymore, which means we can't sustain humanity. And how does agriculture do that? And it's actually the synthetic nitrogen fertilizers that have become a normal practice across the globe, and there is some 120 million tons of nitrogen synthetically produced every year globally. And just imagine that that has to be delivered in every farm and spread to every field. And that contributes to the issue. And the issue is called climate change. But it's not just the energy that is required for synthetic fertilizer production and the transport, the logistics of it, it is the fact that when nitrogen fertilizer is in the soil, the bacteria will break it down as a natural process. And through that natural process, to convert the nitrogen fertilizer to nitrate so plants can take it up, it releases nitrous oxide. And nitrous oxide is a greenhouse gas, a very potent greenhouse gas. It's 265 times more harming to the environment than carbon dioxide. And once it's released in the atmosphere, it will persist for more than 100 years. So you can understand how big the issue is. Agriculture today is responsible for 20% of all the greenhouse gas emissions globally. So I thought, we have to do something about it. I have to do something about it. How can we turn something bad into something good? And this is where Arleaf technology was born. And Arleaf is a photocatalyst, so basically a mineral or a semiconductor, that once you shine 
a high intensity light, which is UV, will charge and they can spend this charge to break down molecules. So it has been proven that, um, and photocatalysts have studied in the last uh, 100 years quite well. So we know that under certain conditions, we can break down nitrous oxide to inert material and nitrate. So the innovation of Arleaf is the production of the material through a process that we have a patent on that allows the material to work under normal light. So with less intensity of light, which is the outdoors, we can still make it work. So we went further and we put this into a formulation, a package basically that farmers can just simply add into the spraying tank and spray crops with it, at the same time as putting other inputs. And there where it sits on the foliage, it will capture nitrous oxide from the air and will break it down to nitrate. So plants can take this nitrate up and grow better. And what this allows really is the farmers to reduce the amount of nitrogen that they apply. And as a consequence, we're reducing air pollution and we're reducing the impact of climate change. There are 26,000 people dying prematurely every year in the UK alone because of respiratory diseases uh, that are related to nitrous oxide. So that is our leaf. And I hope plants are going to find it, find it interesting. But I also hope that plants are going to see us as a useful contribution to their life cycle. And a lot of times I wonder, are we slaves to the plants? because we water them and we look after them, we collect the seeds, we make sure they're weeded and uh, make sure that they thrive. And I really hope that we are gonna learn from plants because they have built these connections with the environment and their surrounding and our other life on earth and they know how to adapt so that they can thrive and continue generation after generation. I hope that with innovation, we can reduce the impact of climate change and avoid an imminent catastrophe globally. But innovation alone might not be enough or might not be fast enough to prevent it. So we need to act individually. We need to look at our habits as consumers, commuters, and uses of the resources that are on Earth so that we don't become a burden to the planet. Small changes collectively can make the existence of future generations possible. Thank you.